thank you all for coming out and uh, taking a bit of step of faith. Um, I know that uh, you're in a transitional period with pastors and such right now, so Joan took a risk <laughs> sending me out here uh, in his stead for, for a short period. Um, I joked with him that I was going to bring some uh, photos from his youth uh, as, as um, a way to kind uh, of get one up on him, but uh, I decided against that, just to keep his friendship <laughs> intact. Um, my name's Adam Corman. I'm originally from uh, central Pennsylvania, a little town called Center Hall, um, just a little bit outside of State College. I'm here with my wife of almost 23 years and my son, uh, Hunter, who's 16, and my wife, Rosemary. Uh, we actually met 13 years prior to our engagement, actually 14 years prior to our engagement, at a church camp in Carlisle. So we actually stayed in contact through, there's enough older folks in here that I can say these things, you know what I mean, pen and paper. We used to do that kind of thing and write. Um, so, uh, and then she would occasionally send me some, uh, uh, some mixtapes and stuff like that with Christian music. But, um, and I know there's people in here that have no idea what a tape is, but anyways. So I was kind of asked to come here uh, and give a kind of a brief history and kind of a how I do what I do in the world of fly fishing and the gospel. So one of the things that I decided to do was, because I work with veterans um, as often as I possibly can through an organization that you see up on the, on the screen called Cross the Divide. I partnered with them about a year ago because I have an infinity for people. <laughs> um, and there's a kind of couple of groups of people that God is really placed on my heart over the years. Some of those that are in recovery, some are those that are uh, veterans, active or retired. Um, and then some of them are just kids. Um, so there's a couple organizations that I kind of have my hands in with the fly fishing. Because when I started the guiding, I did not want to do something that I love just to make money at it. It just didn't seem fair. It wasn't who I was. And to be honest, it, it just, it, it, it fell short. So I, it needed to have substance. It needed to have purpose. Well, then what dawned on me was is the fact that whether I'm a clerk at a convenience store or I'm a plumber or I'm a fly fisherman, those things all need to be done for God's glory. Amen. And if we're gifted to, in those areas, we need to figure out a way to use that to our advantage, if you will, in that regard. So what I decided to do today there's a program of sorts that we take when we do groups of veterans called My Story that we take them through. And it was actually um, designed by a gentleman who's not a veteran, but is in love with our men and women that serve in our military. And it's been used now over 5,000 people in the last three or four years. And it's a really simple process, but the micro version that I'm gonna take you through real quick today is an opportunity for you, because I wanted to give. I didn't want to just talk about me. I wanted to give you some tools to walk away from that you can apply, whether you're fly fishing or whether you're a plumber, that you can find ways in your story and God's story to convey the truth of Jesus Christ to people. And so I, I won't be like bearing down too much on a lot of fly fishing analogies, although they may pop out as they go because that's just how it works, but that's, that's part of the key right there. It's part of our story and as we tell it, layered with God's story, because it's, the, and here's an analogy for you right away to start us out. So if you think of a river as God's story, as the grand big story, the, the um, as N.T. Wright called it, the, the big story that matters, is that everyone, every river in this country only exists, per se, because of the tributaries that feed into it. If those tributaries run dry, those tri tributaries get poisoned, the story or the river starts to kind of be affected quite. And that doesn't mean that we affect God's story and his strength and his power. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the Christian story told through time consists of every single one of those tributaries, which is every single one of your stories mine and the rest of the world um, and it's important to understand how valuable your story is um, and to give you a counter example of that before I dive into this there's so many folks who especially myself even when I sit around 
a campfire, and we're going through this process with people, and for the first time ever, some of these folks get to tell their stories, and they're not always clean and fun and pretty, because brokenness entered the world and messed a lot of stuff up. It continues to do so. So you sit there and you're comparing like, oh, my story's not like that. It's just, I don't really have one. Well, the reality of it is, is that as you said earlier, Barry, there's one consistent thing, theme in the Christian story, which is the real story, the true story of the whole world in all reality, is that we all have redemption. Jesus didn't pick and choose per se. He came to seek and save the lost. Amen. And I just happen to be one of those lost, <laughs> whether my story is prettier than the next person's or not. Um, but people's stories are really important. So there's kind of four or five stages we take people through. Uh, the first one is, uh, if you'll pop the next slide up there. Um, well, that's just kind of repeated what I already said. Sorry, next slide. <laughs> so there's some participatory parts in this. We look at things. I want you to picture yourself, whether it's on the stream or on the job or whatever vocation, and I like that word better, vocation, than just your job. The reason is, is because um, in the, in the, the, between Protestants and Catholics, we have this, this little bit of, well, there's a few dichotomies, but there's one where vocation many years ago was looked at as something was only priestly, that you had to live a monastic life, you had to be behind a pulpit, and that was vocation, which is a which is just a Latin word for kind of a Christian calling. And the Protestants stepped in in the Reformation, and they said, no, 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 we're all called. Matter of fact, the, 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 the scripture tells us that as we go, preach the gospel. Where are you going? Doesn't matter. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing. Now, has God gifted us in certain areas? Of course. So we're all called, and we all kind of have this place that we're at. I just happen to be truly, I don't want to say use the word fortunate, blessed and just overwhelmed with the grace and mercy of God to have been given the opportunity as of the last few years of my life to take people on fly fishing guided trips to teach them in creation. And it's made the job of presenting the gospel, whether it's just a seed or whether we get right to it, um, very easy. And, he's, and, and I got to thinking about that while we were singing there, and I'm like, well, he's made it easy for all of us, actually. He's given, he's revealed himself, his nature, his attributes, and creation. All we have to do when people start to experience wonder is point them in the right direction. Give them the answer for that. Um, so one of the things that we, we do with this process, and you can take these steps and use them. You just have to be creative enough and open enough for God to kind of lead you to see these things as they are in your life. I mean, fly fishing is easy. Plumbing, maybe you got to think a little bit more about that, but they're there. The stories are there. The analogies are there. And why is story important, first of all? Well, first of all, we see all through Scripture it's a big story, isn't it? It's, it's 66 books of story of God's grand story. Jesus told in parables all the time, partially because People like me are idiots and couldn't figure it out directly. So he had to spoon feed it to us. Um, but story is important. It conveys truth quite remarkably easy. Another thing I like about story is that when it comes to people who are apathetic or, or when there's a lot of cynicism involved, story grasps people. It's why it seems like every superhero movie that's been out forever seems to always point towards a redemptive narrative. You can't escape it. It's woven through the fabric of this universe, and it's just a matter of us discovering our story and how it fits in God's, and tell it, and tell it so that people can see him, and it's really important. So one of the things that we start with, no pun intended, is the beginning or innocence, and, and here's a participatory part. Anybody, when I say the word, or you hear or read the word innocence, what are some things that kind of come to your mind? Just a, a single word, anyone. Child baby. Child, baby. Okay, what else? Not guilty. Not guilty, I like that. Innocence, in the scriptural story, in the biblical story, you can kind of picture the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, as some theologians have put it, you have the community of the Trinity. And I can kind of, you know, imaginative way, of course, see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit sitting there in, in, in a committee, kind of 
kind of discussing creation and how it's all going to kind of unfold. And a lot of people say, well, why did God create? Did he need something? Well, God has no needs. He doesn't uh, have a desire in that regard where he lacks. But because the uniqueness of the God that we serve, that triune God, within that trinity, there's love. So God created out of love. And we see that, we use the word peace in our modern day vernacular, but the Hebrew word shalom is much deeper and much more uh, impactful where it talks about peace, sure, but a completeness, a wholeness. Um, I hate to use this word, but real prosperity, not deep pockets, but deep community, deep relationships. Most importantly, a relationship that is grounded and founded on a relationship with God. And we see that peace at the beginning. And what does that look like for mankind? Well, we see, we, we see a whole lot less struggle, right? We see not being consciousness of our nakedness. We see no guilt, no shame, no sin, no brokenness. For me, innocence looks a lot like, when I can think of those times of innocence in my life, I think of my great-grandparents that lived... Um, my one grandmother, or my grandmother lived into her 70s, and my great grandfather lived into his mid 90s. And there's something special about them. I'm the oldest of all the grandchildren, so I got to experience a lot of the, the death, but I also got to experience the hugs with the $5 bills in the hands. And uh, forever I thought grandparents smelled like Clorox. Come to find out that that's just what my grandmother cleaned everything with. I remember the days of sitting over the uh, in the kitchen and we were cracking from their three-acre garden out back, cracking the green beans and helping in those kinds of things. I remember my grandfather, who was incredibly active in my life, trying to teach me things. I remember him correcting me when he heard me cuss for the first time. He said, like, we don't say that word. And I mean, how often do we even hear that nowadays? Anybody getting corrected of things like that? I remember him telling me stories because he grew up in the Great Depression. I mean, their daily meal was groundhog. Still haven't tasted it, just I'm not looking forward to tasting it. So, um, but I remember those things that reminded me of a time where I was, I was maybe in a blissful state. Um, a really good way to kind of round that off, I have it here a quote by, um, by a, a gentleman who used to be real well known, and for controversial purposes, I keep his name out of it just to say it's not mine. He said, "Childhood," because somebody said children is that time when wonder is king, imagination is a playground on which one is oblivious of the rules, undefined by a script. That, in essence, to me, is innocence. It's a time when there was no better time to imagine because there wasn't anything better to imagine. But that didn't stick around. It didn't last. And you can think to yourself, you know, how long can you think of the term innocence in your own life. Now, I'll stop there and pause just to say that as I'm telling you, this is what we're doing on the screen. This is how we're talking to groups of veterans and church folks. This is a way for people to discover and to be very reflective on their lives because it's amazing how many times that we look back and we think of these times and we start to see God present in our lives when we may have denied him or thought that he didn't step in until we bowed our knee. It's interesting how when we unpack God out of the box and we realize that, um, as the Veggie Tales used to say, he's bigger than the boogeyman. You know, he created this universe. I think it was, uh, oh, what's the statement of the name? Anyways, Charles, uh, Chuck Colson used to always quote him and he said, paraphrasing, he says, there's not one square inch of creation that Christ does not claim as mine. There's nothing that's not his in that regard. And we sometimes forget that. Um, I know I have. I've bottled him up in the, in the church casing, and that's where he stayed. Um, but he's bigger, much, much bigger. Um, and his story is, is much, much bigger. But what happened was, next slide, please, is something happened. And here's an example of, and, and this is not a theological um, uh, teaching. This is a way to take God's word. Do not alter the story as its principle, but to share it with people in a manner that they will grasp it because it's in a narrative form. It, it, it's, it's how it's affected you, but you can still point back to the details. So 
we think of brokenness when it entered the world in Genesis 3. And we have the story of a man, a woman, and a snake. And in that garden rests a tree, firm upon its well-grounded roots. And that tree had gained quite a gaze from the first woman, whose attention was upon it by no other means than the tempter's question, did God really say? And as the first man stood idly by watching while she ate rather than stopping her, the world fell to darkness. And by that first taste of rebellion, a taste that was surely realized as bitter. As the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, we have been falling ever since the fall. And from the very first recorded time in history, blood was shed by the hand of God to begin the redemptive process. And you hear a lot of questions, especially when people are telling their stories in groups as to why did God put that tree there? And, and my answer is simply this, because he knew he could redeem us. Um, I got another little theory about it on that sometimes we do this chronological stompery kind of thing that C.S. Lewis used to talk about where, well, if I was there, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah, right. Um, whether it was a tree or whether it was uh, something else, I'm sure I would have fallen. Um, see, brokenness enters all of our stories at some point. And for me, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of it because we don't have the time to do so, but I have opportunities to share these types of things on the stream because they come up. Remember a gentleman uh, was last... It was last spring sometime, and we were on a creek in the Laurel Highlands. He was, I think this gentleman was in his 60s, and we're fishing, and he had brought a couple other uh, people with him. And he was upstream, and he made a couple casts after he worked through some kinks, and he pulls his trout out of the water, and he looks up at me, and he's in tears. Now, I'm not afraid of that kind of thing, but I'm like, it never happened to me on the stream to that point, and I'm like, Okay, what's going on here? And he looks at me and goes, Adam, you have no idea how important this fish is to me. And he just starts pouring his heart open to me, telling me about the situation his mother's in, telling me his health situation, telling me his work situation. He began to pour his story out to me. What an incredible opportunity when somebody becomes vulnerable to us and we become vulnerable to them. It isn't an opportunity to manipulate. It's an opportunity... For us to love that other person. And man, oh man, oh man, oh man. It's just amazing. It is not creation worship. It is creation screaming God's existence. And his nature. I mean, think about our nature and what we're like. And God says creation tells us what he's like. I mean, it's completely and utterly. I'm amazed every, I'm in wonder. Every single moment that I'm out there. Whether we're hiking or whether I'm with people. It just is truly tremendous. Um, but brokenness, it hits all of us. And one of the things that I think about brokenness, because it affects us all in different ways. Um, one of the things that we do, we have a tendency when we think about brokenness or rebellion. And, the, and I'm not, and I'm purposely not using the word sin, because I know everybody in here knows what that word means. But I'm purposely not using it as an example because if you walked up to somebody on the street that was under the age of probably 65 and you said, you're a sinner, they look at you and go, what was that? Because I've been in conversations where I've shared Jesus and people go, who is that? And that is terrifying to me. So I'm using another word that conveys the same idea but is, if you will, a lot more... I don't like to use the word relevant, but it conveys the idea to people. Is it just how I'm going to put it? So that, that brokenness and that rebellion, we have a tendency to, to, to think about how it's affected us from the outside in. So I'm going to tell you a, a quick story when brokenness really hit me back in 1997 into 98. I, had, I was coming out of a what I found out later at the time to be a, basically a cult in the Christian world. <laughs> And I was in a school in Crawley, Texas, where apparently we were being um, subjected to this craziness. And one of the things that started the process of getting away from that is my grandmother, who lived in Florida, called me. And she said, hey, Adam, would you mind, please tell me, she's pleading with me, to come and talk to your grandpa, Marlon. And I was like, 
sure, why, when? And she goes, I, he's not doing well. She knew something medically that none of us did. And she goes, I don't know how long he's going to be here. And we've been talking a lot about God. And he claims that he is an atheist. So she's like, I need you to hear as quick as possible. So I go to the dean and earmark of a cult, by the way. I said, hey, I told him the story. And the guy's like, well, we don't leave. You leave and you're not, you're not part of this. I'm like, goodbye. <laughs> so I packed up whatever I could in my little Ford Escort and drove from Texas over to Lacanto, Florida and spent the next month just eating grapefruit with my grandfather who I didn't realize was very soon going to pass away. And we had conversations. Did I see him surrender his life in front of me? No. Um, I don't know if I'll see him again. But the truth is, is that we, we, we had that opportunity. We took that opportunity. And we left for the holidays, came back to central Pennsylvania. And in that process, some other things began to happen. My... I met up with some old friends out in the countryside. Uh, they were coming out of this trailer, and my friend Jeremy, who there's a huge backstory behind that. Suffice to say, we took this kid in. He slept with a baseball bat beside his bed because his father-in-law would get drunk and walk over and start beating him. So it was a self-defense thing to have that baseball bat. The kid was 14. And I watched Jeremy, he's coming out with this group of people, and he's like, hey, this guy's going to go buy us some alcohol. He goes, I know you don't approve of this. And I stopped a mid-sentence, and I said, you know I don't approve of that. I said, I love you, but don't expect to see me at your funeral. So how quickly brokenness is hitting on the outside, but how quickly my brokenness on the inside starts to say really stupid things. And here's why it's stupid. On a Early morning in January, I think it was the 19th of January of 1998, I get a phone call from a friend. He says, hey, Jeremy's dead. I said, what do you mean Jeremy's dead? I said, that's not funny. Brokenness again, hitting somebody. He goes, why would I joke around with like something like that? And I said, well, your life's a joke. This is me, super Christian, right? Telling him all these things. Come to find out that my good friend Jeremy, my good friend Jen, and a friend from school, Christy, were all out drinking except for Jen. Jen went there um, in her defense. She would actually go there because when these guys would get drunk and high, they would beat each other up. She was there to break up the fights. Few of them left to go get refreshments, if you know what I mean. And in that process, they had kind of passed out and Amber popped out of the fireplace and burnt them to the ground. Well, then I get a phone call shortly after that that my grandpa, Grandpa Marlin, who actually grew up in Tamaqua, Ended up, he loved fruit trees. He walked across the road to help a neighbor with his fruit trees, and he died. Then, in this whole entire process, and little did I know when I told Jeremy or that I you know, wouldn't see him at his funeral, that it would be literally days and his funeral would happen. Then, I go to Florida to spend time with my grandmother, and in that whole process, I'm down there, and she's weeping profusely through the night, we get another phone call within days of me being down there. Your grandfather's died. Which grandfather? And I mean, not that that mattered. So I'm back in Pennsylvania again now, having lost all these people. And then finally that year, uh, a couple months after that, a really good friend of mine, Becky Irvin, was in the hospital with mono. And because of my whacked out ideas, theologically, nobody called me because they thought I was going to go in there and start a revival and all kinds of crazy stupidness. Um, she, her spleen broke and she died. And this was a lot. It was a lot to take. But looking back and telling that story isn't to manipulate anybody. It's to show that not only brokenness has really touched my life in just that one story, we all got stories very similar to that. Amen. And that's what that rebellion and that brokenness has done. But in the middle of all of that, my brokenness from the inside is affecting the lives around me. Just with its stupidity. And see, one of the things that brokenness has done when that whole fiasco went down in the Garden of Eden was is it created this massive chasm between us and God. And it created a chasm that nobody in this room or in this world that ever existed or ever will except for one person could ever rectify and bring it back together. There was no way that we could right these wrongs. You know, we talk about that all the time. You know, go make that right wrong, or wrong right. And there are kind of 
lower level ways that we do that, we apologize and we ask for forgiveness. We, we offer forgiveness, but not the kind of real forgiveness that we needed because that kind of rebellion, it required a penalty. It required, it, it acquired a debt that there was no way that we would ever, 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 ever pay. And I think of that in terms of my conservation side when I'm out and we're fishing and people are like, can I keep this fish? And I'm like, well, I take, you know, hundreds of people on the stream and if I took every fish out that somebody wanted, so we purposely uh, fish a lot of catch and release because I have a duty as a steward the best I can to preserve those things. And that's the little bit of relationship and fixing that I can do or the preventative maintenance, if you will, that I can do but the kind of work and the preventative maintenance that we all require must come from something bigger than just our fellow man, even though many times it comes through our fellow man. Um, there's so many things that, that a person could talk about in the brokenness. And I want you to picture this for a minute. We just did this beautiful event in Virginia with some active duty folks that are in the Navy and in the Marines and a lot of young people. And man, were my eyes open to a lot of things I didn't even realize that, that happens in the military, especially that grinding and that sternness that seems to, um, almost like you're packing a, uh, a, a muzzle loader where you just, you're shoving and punching things down in it and you throw a cork on it. And we gave these folks opportunities to tell their stories and to hear a story of vulnerableness like this and wow, Everybody chose to do it. Nobody has to. That's a requirement. You do not have to be vulnerable and share, but we want you to listen and if you choose to. And everybody just cracked open. And it's amazing. And I'm not going to tell any of their stories. That's their stories to share. Uh, suffice it to say, it did not take me long to where I was in, in tears and sympathy and pity. And that's one of the reasons that we tell that story. That we have opportunities to tell our own story when we see it, when it, when it kind of weaves its way and gives us that opportunity because ultimately God's story is what we're kind of riding this all through. And none of it makes sense without of it, without it. As a matter of fact, fly fishing, freedom, none of it makes sense if God does not exist. I mean, freedom has no real foundation. It's just, well, your freedom and my freedom, who, who cares? But when we understand true freedom, that changes the whole entire idea and our worldview, the way we see reality. Um, so we think of this, this, this brokenness, and there was a, these points, multiple points in my life, from suicide to seeing my father broken like I've never seen him because of adulterous situations in our family, and many, 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 many others. And there was a point where I needed to be rescued. I would go as far to say, as, as Martin Luther kind of put it, the reformer, that what changed him and turned him was he actually came, he confronted, he was confronted with his sin and realized the gospel is not a story for sinners only. It's a, it's a, story, it's a, it's a story for saints. This is something I've got to be reminded of because how quickly do I forget that I'm as bad as I really am? And telling that brokenness does remind me of that. And, but it also reminds me of what I said earlier that from the very beginning, God had a plan. He had a plan to redeem us. He wasn't fumbling around. He knew it was coming. He saw it was coming. And he began to make, um, next slide, please. And thank God for rescue. Thank God. And, and I can think of times in my own life where people kind of came to my rescue. Maybe you were drowning at some point and somebody jumped in. We were just walking a, a pretty hefty hike near our house and it seemed like we came into the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden there was one of those uh, uh, those life uh, donuts that's just randomly there. But the creek that we were hiking along is just terrific. And I don't mean terrific and it's terrifically beautiful, but at least five to 10 people lose their lives on it every year because it's just very dangerous. And it's interesting that somebody had the note to actually put that out there that hoped that somebody would be there to throw that out as a rescue. And... Thankfully, we see that rescue, that we see it in John 1. We see it, well, we see it all through Scripture, don't we? We see it story after story after story after story in our, in our lives. We see rescue come to us. And it's interesting because it's through this rescue that 
there wasn't just a bridge that was built. God filled it in. He filled in the gap. He didn't just build a bridge. He did much, much more than that. And the, the price for rebellion needed to be paid. And here's something that kind of dawned on me. And this is something I try to convey because my story shows my brokenness, which puts me on equal ground with everybody. So when the motivation for that transaction of there needs to be a price for this, there needs to be something has, there's a consequence, a massive consequence to rebellion, is it wasn't just God merely being angry and wanting to get back at us. He realized that that relationship was broken and through love, he chose to do what he did with his son. And I think about that for a minute. And this is a hard one for me because one of the stories of one of our, our recent veterans, um, and he'll, he, he'd be okay with me sharing part of this because it's not specific. Um, he was in a relationship really early in his life and he had had a child and the relationship fell apart and this woman for 12 years took that child and left. Now, this is a guy, when I first met him, I told him, I said, he's loud. And I said, as soon as you opened your mouth, man, I appreciate every word you said, because he talked nothing about family the entire time we were together. And man, did I appreciate that. And he's telling this story, and I, and I started thinking about that for a minute, how much I love my son. And if somebody came and took that away from me, what would I do? What lengths would I go to to get my son back? because of how much I love him. And I ask you the same question. You think of somebody that you just love and why you love them and how you know you love them. And what would you do? What would you do to, to, to get that person back? And then you put yourself in God's shoes per se. What he did to get us back. Um, I know there's a lot, there, there, there's a lot of controversy on some stern theological uh, views when it comes to the series The Chosen. But wow, what a way the best they possibly can to portray some of these things that really quickens my imagination to see those kinds of things that realize the real struggles that the flesh that Jesus bore was not supernatural. That wasn't the supernatural part per se, at least not at that moment. And it took beatings, it took hurt, it took pain. He felt everything. I actually think that he still continues to feel some of our pain, to be honest. He's, he's still standing in the gap. He, re he realizes we still need rescue daily. Amen. And there's a lot of things that God did for me in rescuing me. And the one thing that obviously sticks out the most, and this, is, this may find you surprised by everything I've said so far, is that in 1987, in a three-piece suit about this color, it was real nice, with these terrible cowboy boots. I was age 11 at the Calvary Baptist Church at the top of the hill in Center Hill Mountain. They had a VBS going on, which is interesting. You guys just finished your VBS. Um, and it, I wasn't at it, but my sister and brother were. And at the end of that week, I don't know if you guys still do this. Maybe it's a Baptist thing. Maybe it's just an old school VBS practice. But they used to do the boys against the girls to raise money for missions, and they would bring all these pennies in, right? And whoever had the most pennies, you know, got cheered on and all that. And, Doc, and Pastor David Annan, he was a neighbor of ours, and he had, I think he had five daughters. God bless that man. I have no idea how he did that. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, he went home to be with Jesus. That was tough for me because he was still old school in the sense that he would visit every single church member and he cared and he 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 would let me come into the church when when there was no service and and pray and sometimes we'd go bible study and pretend i was a preacher at the front of the pulpit and um he would come in there and pray with us and it, it was just awesome and i remember him giving you know that message of salvation and i was looked at my parents and i just it conveyed something so real to me even an 11 year old I went forward, I went downstairs with one of the counselors, and for an hour, I weeped my eyes out. While the kid sitting beside me that responded to laughed the entire time, I'm like, well, I don't know about demons, but <laughs> sure, sure seemed that way. Uh -huh. But uh, come to find out, that particular kiddo had a really, 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 really bad life. Um, a lot of brokenness. 
And but that was age eleven, and my parents didn't go to church. My parents dropped us off to church so that they could home and do what parents did when the kids weren't around, whether it was sleep or whatever. And so we didn't grow up in a Christian home. We didn't grow up where my parents taught us anything as, as far as what I saw them do, which was work and fight, work and fight, work and fight. So there was a huge piece of my life. I knew nothing other than what happened that day. And my great grandparents, thankfully, back when people still did this, got all of us our first Bibles with the little uh, foil imprints on them. I used to do that at a, at a, a place I worked at years ago in, in Florida. And um, so there's there's so much that my great grandparents, man, what a what a wonderful generation that we have to to contrast and, and look at. Um, but I remember that time when God rescued me. And I look back to it because the seeds of the gospel were planted in my life that carried me through a lot of hell, a lot of hell. And it was amazing to see all the things that God used to continue to rescue me and mature that over and over and over again. And I'll tell you, fly fishing is a big rescue for me. It may seem odd to say that, but fly fishing introduces people immediately to wonder. And wonder is really easily defined as anything that is bigger than you that you just stand there and go, what the? And psychologists are starting to learn a lot of amazing things that wonder is good for. One of the interesting things is, uh, among many, is that it causes people to be, they, 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 they find themselves faced with something bigger than they are. Maybe it's the night sky. Maybe it's the beauty of a trout stream. Maybe it's finally executing that cast that lands the fly where it should be and drifts it as it ought and a fish takes it and you end up with the net and the pretty picture. The whole thing kind of coming together, maybe it's just being out there, Rick, right? And just experiencing things that you're like, why do I feel so close to God out here? It almost feels awkwardly wrong, but it's very right because God's trying to get our attention in those regards, even as a Christian and continue to encourage us and so on and so forth. And wonder makes people try to make sense of what they're experiencing. And that's fascinating because I know from studying it for years, the, the world of, of naturalism and atheism makes absolutely positively no sense of those things. They're cosmic accidents. Wonder is, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's, if, if it exists at all in a world without God exists, you can't make sense of it. It's an accident. And worse than that, it's, it's an accident that's basically deceiving you to cause something else. It's not even real. But to make sense of things like that, it causes you to realize you're not alone. There's something bigger than you, including your community around you. But it forces people to try to make sense of it. So when I take somebody onto the stream, it doesn't take long where I start looking for opportunities to talk. And here's a good example of this because the next slide is kind of where we kind of round things off on, which is restoration. And restoration, excuse me, you're good with that. Okay. Uh, or good, is, do I have restoration in there? Yeah, that's an one. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're good. Um, I appreciate you doing that. Um, so one of the things that's a cool opportunity that I get, so when you're fly fishing, you have these, you, you, there's a lot of obstacles to overcome. When you learn about the anatomy of a trout, I just taught a class for five and a half hours to 11 adults yesterday before we come out here. And we go through this whole gamut of, I wanna give you all kinds of trouble to overcome, and then here's how we overcome it. And one of the things that we have to overcome in the trout world, <clears throat> uh, well, I mean, you have their eyesight, you have the, the vibration feelings that they have on their lateral line. You have all the hydraulics that you have to deal with because you want your fly attached to something, landing on the water, drifting as if it's not attached to something. You want it to look real so the fish takes it. So you go through all these different processes and stuff. <clears throat> and when you're fishing under the water, subsurface with what we call a nymph, which is the kind of primary stage of these insects before they emerge. Um, and the reason we do that is because there's two guarantees in a trout world. One is they're wet. They live in the water. 
The second one is, is 90% of their diet is under the surface of the water. It's not the beautiful things we see like when the river runs through. Those seasons come and go, and we do have those opportunities, but most of it's subsurface. So we have to learn the trout. We have to learn the insects. We have to learn the hydrology. And now we've got to take all that and put it together and execute a cast and a drift with that insect without seeing it under the water. We have to trust the facts. For instance, um, we have to trust, and these are conversations that I've had on the stream. We have to trust the fact that history shows that a man named Jesus Christ from a town of Nazareth existed. It's undeniable facts. We have to trust that this man lived for roughly 30 years and had a few disciples and at some point died by a Roman cross, by execution by Roman hands on a, on a cross. Facts, undeniable facts from history. We have to trust that sometime after Jesus' death, his disciples experienced what they claimed to be risen Jesus Christ, and it transformed them. It took a skeptic like Paul and turned him to a believer that Jesus and, the, and that God used to write three quarters of the New Testament. It took a skeptic like his brother, James, who did not even show up sometimes when Jesus preached and ended up being the first pastor of the Jerusalem church. And it grew the church of Jesus Christ so fast and so quick, and it continues to do so. Those are some facts about the resurrection that cannot be denied. They're solid historical things, much like the hydrology and, and your casting and what the fish are like and what you're putting on the end of that. And then we have this thing that we call faith, although it is oftentimes misinterpreted as being blind, it's not. It's trusting in what we do know. So we can trust in the facts that we know that Jesus existed and rose from the dead. <coughs> and we do that same thing on the stream, and these things are just constant that are in front of us all the time. And I hope as I'm saying this, some of the wheels are turning in your own lives, whether you're a hairdresser, you're a clerk, that you start to see that your story is woven like tapestry, or for where we're at today, like a, a, a Lancaster quilt. <laughs> that you can't pull these things apart, you just have to start seeing them as they are and telling the story. And we see this beautiful story of restoration offered to us. Now that's a stretch for some people because it's not something we see. We're basing the truth of that off of what we know. Right off of his faithfulness already. And I kind of want to round this up off to something in two ways. I want to give you another story for contrasting. And then I want to show us and kind of finalize this all with what we really do have to look forward to. Because not every time do we go out do we catch fish. There has to be something bigger. Our motto in our, our, our uh, guide service, Journey on the Fly, is it's not about the destination. It's the journey that makes us. Because if you miss everything going in and coming out of the stream, if you miss the people you're with, if you miss the beauty of when you're walking along and for the first time in, well, 15 years, a grouse pokes out of the, the ground and takes off. And if anybody knows about grouse in this place, they're very rare in PA now. You miss the mist coming off the water and the sun wearing down through it. You miss so many beautiful opportunities. So it can't be about just catching a fish. And isn't it interesting, that's how our characters develop. It's not about where we're going, it's about the process so much of getting there. That we're being formed into the image of Jesus, thank God. Um, so we have this other story that, unfortunately, is, is part of the world's story. And it's just that, it's the world's story. There is no real satisfaction. There is no real ultimate hope. There's, a, there's some temporary hope. But even that is quite subjective. Um, we don't have much meaning and purpose. As a matter of fact, um, from his book, Reasonable Faith, William Lane Craig quotes atheist Bert Bertrand Russell, and he says this about existence. Russell says, um, <clears throat> in his book actually called Why I'm Not a Christian, he says, we must live our lives on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. That's the honest, consistent view without God. Despair. Not just here, but in a sense, forever. And in response to uh, Frederick Nietzsche's Time Magazine advertised quote of God is dead, Francis Saber said, if God is dead, man is dead too. 
That's the world's story. And that's me giving the strong version of that story. The honest version from their own lips. And those people, I don't say that to make it an us and them because they're falling like we are. And we're falling like they are. I'm saying that to give us a contrast because there's your two options. The other option is, is that we trust God and that we see that at some point there will be no pain, there will be no abuse, there will be no hurt, there will be no shame, there will be no lies, there will be no brokenness. And I want to take you to one place, and then I'll shut up, because I'm probably already over my time. <laughs> and in C.S. Lewis's books on Narnia, which I used to be against, as goofy as it is, not realizing how beautiful story is to convey, not realizing that the ancients used to call these things mythos, which are ways to tell the truth sideways. But when, when I'm mocked and said, well, you just believe in things like Aesop's fables, and I'm reminded of some things like G.K. Chesterton used to say, but don't all fables convey truth just differently? It's funny how truth just continues to poke its ugly head up. Um, so in the very last chapter, in the last pages of Lewis's book, The Last Battle, which kind of sets that up in your head already, Lord Diggory explains something that's going on. And he says, listen, Peter, when Aslan saw said, you can never go back to Narnia. He meant the Narnia you were thinking of. But that was not the real Narnia. That had a beginning and an end. It was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and has always will be here. Just as our own world, England or America for us, and all, is only a shadow or a copy of something in Aslan's real world. You need not mourn Narnia, Lucy, all of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door. And of course, it is different. As different as a real thing is from a shadow or as waking life is from the dead. In the very last words of all this, they say all their life in this world, all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. Restoration, it's interesting how much work is put into trout and restoring streams. We try to undo <laughs> the fall, right? But real restoration, real restoration. You know, we've lost a lot of people in our lives. Some of us very recently, very dear to us. And it hurts, but it's supposed to hurt because that's what love does. It connects us and causes that beautiful thing called relationship. And in the middle of all of that, we are not lost in despair, but we have real restoration and real hope in Jesus Christ. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end there. I have no idea where we're at with time, but in the middle of all of that, although I was truthful and told real stories, I wanted to put on display for you things that you can take and think about in more simpler terms to break down to people when you have those opportunities to do so. Even if, and, and, and here's, here's my best advice in the middle of conversations when it comes to many years of evangelism, because John and I met doing skateboarding ministry. Um, I am not doing that anymore. I break too easy and don't heal much faster. So, um, uh, although I find myself breaking in the trout stream sometimes too, but um, one of the things that I've learned through all these years, don't get frustrated if the conversation doesn't go where you think it should. Allow the person you're talking to to take it as far as they will. And I'll give you one example. Um, one of the things that I'll ask people when we were fishing for steelhead in Lake Erie, which the smallest fish that you will catch there is 18 to 20 inches. It's a riot. It's so much fun. And this gentleman, Leland, had come up from Virginia Beach and we were fishing. He had no idea. So I started asking him things like, hey, do you like to read? Because that begins to reveal a lot about a person. Yeah, and he starts talking to me about things. He goes, my pastor has a book that he read and I want to get it and start reading. But an hour later, we're eating lunch and I brought that back up. I said, your pastor has a book, you said. He goes, yeah, yeah, I want to buy it. Read it. I said, so you go to church. For 10 minutes, he preached the gospel to me. <laughs> 
And he's going, I hope I'm not you know, going too far here. And I go, I was just there with this big smile. He had no idea. And then I told him, and I said, man, I want to encourage you. Do that all the time that you get the opportunities to. So it's neat how it even works just getting people encouraged. And that's my encouragement. It's, it's trout fishing is beautiful. If I could take everybody in here and do it, we would. Um, but you have your own stories, your own places God's put you. Man, take those and use those for him. Okay? Any questions, comments? Nobody brought any tomatoes to throw? <laughs> you good? Okay. Thank you so much. So as you all know, and as Adam mentioned in his in his speech, uh, we just finished up our VBS from the from the week, and so I'd like to call Brenda and Robin up here to come give us a report on how how it went, and what happened. 